Our pilgrimage in John's Gospel, reframing Jesus' portraits of glory from John's Gospel, continues today with what is on certain levels the most controversial passage in this entire book. Uh, the controversy, however, is not due to the subject matter, even though the subject matter is a little bit controversial. It involves a woman who is accused of crimes heinous enough to get her killed. Nor is the controversy because it touches on a very contentious political issue, capital punishment. What really makes this passage controversial is a question that is prior to and takes precedence over these other issues. And the question is, does this passage belong in Scripture? That's a pretty significant question. Of course, the passage I'm referring to is the story of the woman caught in adultery, which begins at the very end of John 7. I invite you to turn there and to take your sermon outlines from your bulletins. If you didn't receive a sermon outline this morning, I invite you to take, uh, raise your hand and Greg will make sure that you get one of these. The title of today's sermon is Turning from Sin, and we're going to be looking at John chapter 7, starting in verse 53. I am guessing, as you look down at your Bibles, that uh, most of us have the text of this passage in, the, in your Bible, but you also probably have a little footnote. Do you see a little footnote there? My Bible says in the footnote, the earliest manuscripts and other ancient witnesses do not have John 7, 53 through 8, 11. Now, that may be a little off-putting. You know, wait, it's in my Bible, but it says that the earliest manuscripts don't have that. We, we like everything absolute. We like it black and white, crystal clear. You mean there are portions of Scripture that we're not absolutely sure is in Scripture? Well, uh, yeah. Uh, but what could seem to some a reason to question the credibility of Scripture is for me a testament to its trustworthiness. And I was thinking as I was preparing this sermon, I'm thinking about a certain cult that says they received their scriptures from an angel who came and gave it all to one man, and he all of a sudden has everything, boom, he has a scripture. You know what? The Bible is nothing like that. That story, that fable, is nothing like the true story of scripture that was given to God's people over the course of thousands of years. And to many different people in many different times as God progressively revealed himself, um, these are actually ancient manuscripts that our text of Scripture is based off of. Uh, regardless, any of you remember the movies that Tom Hanks was a part of, the Dan Brown books, the Da Vinci Code, uh, Angels and Demons, and just a couple years ago, Inferno. I'm not sure if anyone actually saw that movie. Um, now, these movies have been controversial among Christians because they espouse theories about Jesus, which portray him not as the divine son of God, but as an average guy who was married, had 2.1 kids and a dog and a, probably a three-car garage. Um, in case you're wondering... There is no historical evidence to support this thesis. It's just someone's myth that they have written, someone's fiction. Um, I'm not talking about the three-car garage. That's certainly not uh, the case. But the idea that Jesus didn't die on the cross, uh, there's nothing historically to support this. The problem is our culture puts more credence into Hollywood fiction than it does historical facts. Regardless, during one of the scenes, uh, Tom Hanks' character discusses a historic meeting early on in the church, the Council of Constantinople. By the way, that's a real council. Really happened. But what Hanks' character describes as happening there did not happen. Uh, he says that there was some conspiracy by which the, tr the books that reflect the truth were cut out. They were voted out by this other group that was in power. And it was just a, a, a small ma majority of a vote uh, uh, was able to bring about the books that we have when the truth was hidden and such a conspiracy. By the way, no historical evidence. So I, I hope, I hope no one watched these movies and thought, oh, wow, this, wow, this conspiracy. And every once in a while you hear people say, we finally found the hidden books of the Bible, the books they didn't want you to read. 
No, they weren't lost. We, we know they were there all the time. We just also knew they were false, so they're not included in Scripture. Um, all of Scripture has been submitted to a really rigorous process um, based on whether it really reflects that was that which was written down, and there are a number of different factors. We're not going to go into. If you want, by the way, if you want to read all, of, if you want to learn all about this, you can go on our website under resources. I have a video there, an hour and a half. It's my Know Your Bible seminar number one, and it goes through how we got our Bible. So you can look at that. We're not going to go in, into all that detail, but the point I want to make is this: is that. The canon of Scripture, by canon, and that's, canon is the word we use to describe um, what we believe is actually part of Scripture, it's been decided for many years. And by the way, before the Council of Constantinople, which is around 381, something like that, um, long before that council, the list of the New Testament books had already been published in a few different historical documents. Uh, so it wasn't at that council that it was decided. Of course, the Old Testament has been firmly established for uh, hundreds of years before that. But all this to say that you can trust that what you have in your Bible is the Word of God. Now, that brings us to another area of study, and that is textual criticism. And textual criticism actually deals with issues like this one that we see in our text today, and that is which passages actually belong. And now, most of textual criticism, you say, what, there's, there's, there's questions about what should or should not be in. Most of the questions are, well, should this verse end with Jesus Christ, or should it end with Jesus Christ, the Son of God? That's most of the differences. In other words, there are differences that do not change any aspect of our faith, and they're very minimal. And here's the thing you need to think about. These are ancient documents. We don't have the original Gospel of John. Are you surprised by that? <laughs> you know, documents crumble. It was written on, you know, parchments, on, on vellum, on papers that are long gone. And so we don't have the original scroll that was written by John. What we have are copies. People made copies. What happens when you make copies of stuff? You have errors. If you're writing out an entire book, I'm even surprised on occasion, I do a lot of reading, on occasion I'll read a book published by a big company and I'll find an error in it. I'm like, where, where is the editor here reading? How do they let this error slip in? And if you think of us having computer programs and all this stuff that help us make sure to have no errors, imagine a scribe writing out by hand uh, entire portions of the New Testament. Well, it's not too surprising, but here's the thing. In the science of textual criticism, see, different, different uh, copies of Scripture were passed along to different communities. And so we find different copies in different areas. We found one in Alexandria. It's called Alexandrinus. That's where one copy of the New Testament was found in Egypt. And then Vaticanus. Can you guess where that was found? At the Vatican, right? So we have these different, but we can trace them back and say, oh, well, right here is where the error must have happened in this geographical location. When a scribe was copying, we can see clearly this was added in. Usually it's an error because if you've ever written something and you look up and you write and you look up, sometimes you accidentally skip down. A, a, you do this when you're reading sometimes. You're just reading along, you realize, oh, I skipped down, I missed something, I need to go back. And so s most of these times it's just simple errors. Sometimes scribes decide, you know what, I need to help them understand this a little bit. So they might put in a note in the, in the side, this is what this is. But then that note, the next scribe comes along and goes, oh, okay, I'll add this in here because that must be part of it. And so that's how that gets added in. Some things, and this is a unique one, because this happened early on in the church, the one that we're looking at today. It had to happen early on because some of the earliest documents have it, but the absolutely earliest ones don't. And so you wonder, how did this get in here, this story about this woman? Well, it's probable that this really happened early on in the church. And because you remember, there's a significant oral history that's going along too. People are passing stories of things that happened, things that Jesus did. And by the way, if you remember, in John itself, John actually says Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. And so even the Gospel of John says, hey, Jesus did a lot of other things that aren't in this book. 
Um, if you tried to fill, fill a book with all of them, you, you, you know, you couldn't have a book that big. Uh, so we believe that this story, probably scholars believe, that it actually happened, but it wasn't part of John's original manuscript. And therefore, we don't actually look at it as inspired scripture. However, so, so then here's the problem as a pastor, then what do I do with this? Do we skip it? I actually have some commentators who have their commentary, and if you want to look for the commentary in this passage, you got to turn to the appendix. So it's not even included in the, you know, as you go along through the commentary. Um, Here's what I determined about this story, is that what we're going to do is we're going to focus on truths, passages that underlie what's communicated here, because what's communicated in our passage today is nothing new. And by the way, that's the truth with Every single discrepancy, every little question, it's not something that's going to change the nature of your faith. But uh, so there's nothing, there's nothing new here in this story. And so what we're going to do is we're going to do a little biblical channel surfing today. We're going to go through scripture and go to passages which lie underneath what this passage communicates um, for our focus. By the way, this isn't my usual MO. I don't usually like to hit a bunch of passages because I want us to exposit just one passage of scripture so we keep true to what's being communicated. It's too easy when you're, when you're hopping all over the place to pull things out of context. But for today's passage, I think it's actually a good thing to hit a few different passages. So without any further ado, ado follow along as I read John seven fifty three through 8, 11. Then each went to his own home, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him And he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. And the law of Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, If any of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. Have you ever noticed that in verse 9? Who leaves first? It's the older ones. It has to be a reflection of the fact that the older you get, the more you are aware of your failings. The younger you are, you know, I'm, I'm all good, you know. But the older ones, they go, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm dropping my stone. I'm walking away. What a powerful story, though. The religious leaders bring a woman to Jesus caught in adultery, sure that they finally got it. We finally got an opportunity to trap him. It's a lose-lose. If he says, forgive her sin, then he looks like a liberal. He's lawless, as if he's ignoring God's law. But if he says, stone her, then he seems to transgress the very message of grace and salvation that he's been preaching. Then, in a move that is really nothing short of genius. You might even say divine. Jesus gives the religious leaders some of their own medicine with a conundrum that they cannot overcome. Go ahead, stone her. But start with the one who has no sin. Notice he doesn't say, all you who stone her don't have to have sin. Just just the first one. The first one to throw the stone needs to be one without sin. Uh, when, you, when you think about it, uh, what an extraordinary response. Um, however, the story raises a very difficult dilemma. It was a dilemma in that day, and it's still a dilemma in our day. In the simplest form, it's this, purity or mercy. We have the same issues in our culture today. Do we prioritize purity, in other words, doing what is right, what is good, or do we prioritize mercy? 
showing forgiveness to those who have failed? How do we balance the strong biblical message on sexual purity, for example, in this story, with the doctrine of forgiveness in Christ? Our tendency is to go to one extreme or the other. Um, we, we love extremes. We really do. We just love to camp on an extreme. You talk to people and you get these extreme positions. Uh, somehow on my news feed, this, that I was just sharing with this with someone uh, last day or two. So, somehow on my news feed, I got into this, what seems like a Christian blog, has started popping up with things that are not very reflective of divine mercy. I mean, just some heinous stuff that really clearly contradicts the greatest law, or I should say the second greatest, which is what? Love your neighbor. If you can't speak the truth in love, then keep your mouth shut, is what this blog needs to know. But somehow it's, it's I don't know, so I keep putting, pushing the button, uh, less, less of this, please. Um, but the reason we see these things is because we love extremes. We feel safe in extremes. It gives us a sense of, well, I can just rest in this. That's bad or that's good. Just everything's black and white. Um, the truth is in Scripture, there's a lot of gray stuff. Now, I, you, you got to know me. I'm not espousing some sort of, you know, liberal view. I, uh, trust me, we could have a conversation. I have some pretty strong views about that which Scripture is pretty strong on. There's a lot of stuff that Scripture is pretty clear on. So don't, don't get me wrong there, but, you know, we got to be careful about going to extremes, and this is part of what Jesus communicates in this passage today. Our tendency is to extremes to say either or, it's either this or that, but the message we see consistently in Scripture is both and, both purity and mercy, both of them. Now, I indicated that we would be looking at a great deal of Scripture, and that's what we're going to do. First is the question of purity. Where do we see the importance of purity taught in Scripture? Uh, We can start with the very passage to which these men are alluding. A few passages we see. In Leviticus 20.10, it says, If a man commits adultery with another man's wife, with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress must be put to death. So say, hey, right here, here's here's where it is, Jesus. Uh, A second passage, Deuteronomy 22 22, if a man is found sleeping with another man's wife, both the man who slept with her and the woman must die. You must purge the evil from Israel. Okay, these passages are pretty clear. Adultery is deemed a capital offense. Now, in our day and age, passages like this seem almost inconceivable because we have adopted a morality structure that says anything goes, that, that belittles purity, actually mocks purity, right? And so we look at passages like, we can't even, how do you even process this? Someone dies because of adultery? Um, let's, let's be pretty clear on this. The Bible takes purity seriously, very seriously. It's not what our culture says. Having said this, there is something very interesting about what is missing from the religious leader's case. So back to these religious leaders, they've brought this woman. Can anyone see what's missing? The man! Well, wait a second, we just read both of these passages, right? The passages say both the man and the woman, but where's the man in this story? He's absent. And these leaders, if you notice, they actually have even, and by the way, this is what people do a lot when they want Scripture to say what they want to say, they alter it ever so slightly. And you can't even really tell. Now, our translations make it clear, but if you were reading this in in Greek, you would see that they actually say, uh, they actually use, uh, um, let let me get here in the passage here so I can see what what I'm talking about here. What am I talking about? Um, So verse 5, in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. It doesn't actually say women, 
the, the Greek word gune, it actually just has a feminine form of, of words that are translated such as these. So it's a feminine form of saying uh, a person like this, such as these. Now, if they were biblical, that form would have been neuter. In other words, it's not just the woman, it's the woman and the man. That would reflect the text that we're looking up out, up here. Very slight. All they did is the same word. They just, they just made one feminine instead of making it neuter. And you think, well, that's such a minor difference. But it makes a big difference, doesn't it? Because now they're just focusing on the woman as the one who is to be judged for this sin, when really, if they're following the law of Moses, it should be stoning such men and women. But you see, these men aren't really interested in upholding the law here. In fact, what it leads us to believe is that this really isn't about their desire to have a wrong righted. What is their goal? Well, we're told it in verse 6, aren't we? They were using the question to trap him in order to have a basis for accusing him. But even before that, by the slight alteration of Scripture, we can see that their real purpose was just to trap Jesus. That's all they wanted to do. And so who knows that they, they see Jesus and say, oh, let's, let's find someone, some woman who we know has questionable activities. Let's grab her and we'll bring her in and, uh, and give this, uh, this opportunity to trap Jesus. Now, here's Jesus' response. Do you see it there? What does he do? He, he does this. He gets down and he, he starts writing in the, in the dirt. Now, do you know what he wrote? <laughs> No. Do you know what he wrote? The correct answer is no. No one knows what he wrote. Now, if you read commentaries, they may have conjecture. I don't know if their names is any of the conjecture in any of the commentaries, but there's conjecture. They wrote this. He wrote that. But we don't know what he wrote. You know why? Because it's not important. And I think what's really going on here is that Jesus is, is stalling. He's not stalling because he doesn't know the answer. He's stalling for their sake. He's giving them some time to, to think about what they're advocating. So he's just down riding in the dirt as the men are waiting. And you can tell they're getting a little anxious, right? It says, but Jesus bent down and started to ride on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, so they're, they're, they're starting to get a little frustrated. And then he, he stands up. And he gives his response. Um, I think what he's trying to do is slow down what's going on. We're a culture, by the way, that it is absolutely astonishing how quick we are to judgment. Have you noticed that? Social media has multiplied. I mean, it's amazing how fast our world can all of a sudden... Take this one person who was just, you know, second to God a moment ago, and all of a sudden they're the worst demon ever, and we must destroy them. I mean, this is our culture that we live in. We are so quick to judgment. Jesus slows things down. It's very biblical, isn't it? What does James say? Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. So Jesus is slowing it all down. He said, okay, here are these guys. They got all their judgment. They're ready to go. I'm going to write in the dirt for a few minutes. But they weren't giving up. So we keep reading. Verses 7 and 8 says, when they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, if any of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Again, you have to love Jesus' body language in all this. He again stoops down to write. It's almost as if he's saying, I've made my move, ball's in your court. What are you going to do with this? Uh, by stooping down again, he seems to, again, gives them an opportunity to pause to reflect. Let's think about this. And can you imagine them? And really, Jesus says hardly anything in this dialogue. Do you see this? I mean, he just makes this one statement, and then he's back down writing in the dirt again. And it's like, let this soak in. You who are without sin, you're the one who's going to cast the first stone. So different than our 
than our generation, which is, which is so quick to respond, so quick with jabs. We are ready to, we are ready to go at people if they go, go at us. But wisdom is found in building in time, time to think, time to measure your response. It's almost as if Jesus helps these religious leaders think through this. He doesn't get in their faces. He doesn't put them on edge. He simply speaks wisdom, and then he crouches down to start writing again. It's significant to note that Jesus, at no point in this passage, contradicts the religious leaders. He doesn't say, oh, no, nope, you're wrong. She, no, she shouldn't be stoned. That's not biblical. He doesn't say that at all. He, in essence, says, yep, you're right. She should be stoned. But then his response effectively precludes anyone from actually doing it. I mean, it's just genius. By the way, this coheres with what John himself says about Jesus, what we've already read in John 3.17. We read, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. And then again, Jesus says in John 12, 47, as for the person who hears my words but does not keep them, I do not judge him, for I do not come to judge the world but to save it. Jesus' goal is not condemnation but mercy. That's what he wants to accomplish. Problem is, mercy doesn't come naturally. Oh, we really like it when people are merciful toward us, don't we? We love it when other people show us mercy. But when someone else wrongs us, oh, no mercy here, buddy. You're going to get what's coming to you. Recently, I watched a movie about a man who is one of my spiritual heroes. However, this movie presented a side of my hero that was not very heroic. And I never really seen this before. My hero struggled with some pretty significant vices, but even worse than that, he came off as a bit of a jerk. Now, I trust that the movie, in order to heighten the drama, was emphasizing these rough edges. Um, I must tell you, however, that the movie really discouraged me. I, I, and it caused me to have a few days where I was just coming up in my head. I was thinking about pondering. I was brooding over this hero of mine. And uh, I got to say that I was with a somewhat judgmental attitude as I was brooding about this hero. And then all of a sudden it hit me. I can be a bit of a jerk sometimes myself. And I thought, wow, look how quick I was to judge this hero of mine without even considering my own failings. And you know what happened when, when my own failings came into my mind? Do you know what happened? My attitude towards this hero of mine softened. I, I wasn't feeling quite so judgmental anymore once I was aware and thinking about my own issues. My resentment turned to mercy. Now, I don't know if this is what happened with these religious leaders. In fact, I kind of doubt it because they weren't really about truth. They were just about trapping Jesus. But I do believe that those times when we're bent on making other people pay, when we have a greater awareness of our own failings, it softens our heart. It enables us to show greater mercy. More than likely, what's happening here is they realized that they couldn't throw the first stone. Well, if, if it's perfect righteousness that you're talking about, Jesus... I can't, I can't do that. Nonetheless, it does raise a very significant point. When we are contemplating judgment for the failing of others, we must take our own failings into account. Notice here, Jesus doesn't tell the religious leaders that they're wrong to judge. He doesn't say judgment's bad. He simply calls them to judge fairly, not hypocritically. And that's really his point, isn't it? If you're without sin, you go ahead and throw the first stone. Actually, it isn't judgment that is problematic as far as Jesus is concerned. It's false judgments. In fact, Jesus just got through saying, if we back up just a little bit, John 7, verse 24, Jesus got, just got through saying, stop judging by mere appearances and make a right judgment. He doesn't say, stop judging. And by the way, this is the way a lot, that's why we don't like proof texting. 
go, a passage that is just me grabbing scriptures here and there. Because when you do that, you're liable to not communicate the whole passage. And so have you ever heard anyone say, well, Jesus says, stop judging. Boom. See, you can't judge me anymore because Jesus said it. But what does he actually say here? He says, stop judging by mere appearances. Make a right judgment. In fact, Jesus actually commands us to judge. This is an imperative. He says, yes, make a judgment. Make a right judgment. But don't judge by mere appearances. Another example, this is found in the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew chapter 7, where Jesus says... Do not judge or you too will be judged. Here's another one, right? See, Jesus says right there, do not judge. Boom, mic drop, gotcha, ha. By the way, did any of you see the Jimmy Buffett mic drop? At the, after he sang the national anthem, that was a, a strange, strange version of the national, national anthem that uh, Jimmy Buffett was singing. Um, I'm not sure his, his mic drop was, uh, that his performance was mic drop worthy. Um, But uh, the truth is, the person quoting Jesus here shouldn't stop and drop the mic yet. Instead, they need to keep reading because Jesus goes on to say, for in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. If Jesus' point was that we shouldn't judge at all, then verse 2 doesn't make much sense because it's assuming we're going to make judgments. But verse 2 clarifies Jesus' point that we should be careful how we judge, knowing that we too are subject to judgment. Then, and and all Jesus is doing is saying, yeah, judge with purity, but make sure that you have some mercy involved in there too, right? Uh, And so then he provides this wonderful word picture, which all of us are familiar with, right? Uh, Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see very clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. You see, the issue for Jesus isn't judgment, but it's making right judgments that is, judgments that are not superficial based on mere appearances, and judgments that are not hypocritical, lacking healthy self-examination. Here is Jesus' issue with the religious leaders. Their judgment lacked self-examination. It lacked humility. That was the problem. He knows these individuals that have been sparring with him all along. Now, elsewhere, he goes on to say things like, you guys are like, you're like cups that are clean on the outside, but inside are full of muck. Do you want to drink out of that cup? I don't want to drink out of that cup. And Jesus says, it's just, you've just whitewashed. It's, you're not really pure. It's a lie. So, you know, if we're going to start stoning people, maybe you guys should line up first. So Jesus' issue here is not with, with judgment per se, it's with hypocritical judgment. It's, it's, with, it's with those who have said, well, these are things by which you will be judged. And by the way, in the history of the church, Christians at times have been good at this. We decide which offenses are, are what's the word I'm looking for? Pro- prosecutable offenses? <laughs> we decide which, which are the bad offenses. But we have other offenses here. Well, th- these aren't so bad. So these are really bad. If you do this, you're a bad person. But these, yeah, we can let them go. It's okay. There's a great book by a man who wrote a great book. Uh, (laughs) What's his name? Jerry? He's the one who wrote The Pursuit of Holiness. Help me out. Bridges. That's it. Bridges. He wrote a book that's entitled... I'm losing everything. Why do I start quoting stuff? I can't remember. Uh, The title something like Pretty Sins or, you know, Acceptable sins, maybe it might be acceptable sins. It's, it's, on, it's on my bookshelf. Uh, I read it. Uh, but anyway, uh, but it's true. We have acceptable sins, don't we? We have certain sins. Well, these are okay. These are bad. Uh, Jesus says, no, we need to look in our own lives. Now, there, there is some truth in Scripture, some things that are, that are portrayed more heinously, right? More serious. But... At one level, sin is sin, 
and God's expectation for us is purity. And if we start throwing stones at people before having reflected on our own sin, then we do stuff out of, not out of humility, but out of pride, as if we're the judges. We need to remember that all the judgment comes from God. It's His law, not ours, that we're upholding. So there's this balance that Jesus has here as He communicates. Uh, and so the issue again is um, recognition of our own shortcomings when we begin to get judgmental towards others. And isn't that a pitfall we're all susceptible to? We naturally expect more from others than we do from ourselves. And we don't like to think of ourselves that way. And ironically, we are able to see failings in others more clearly. And I remember someone saying this, and it's really true. A lot of times, the failings we see in others most clearly, the reason we see them so clearly is because they're our own failings too. (laughs) That's why we're so good at pointing them out. I know what you're doing. Yeah, and why do you know? It's because you have the same problem. That's why. Or as we used to say on the playground, takes one to know one, right? In the narrative of John 8, the result of this simple response is powerful. By the way, did you notice in the first nine verses of today's passage, Jesus only speaks in verse 7. And it's just, by the way, it's only eight words in Greek. Just eight words, Jesus communicates this silencing, powerful, genius response He silences his opponents and he drives away this woman's accusers. Verse 9. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. The older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Uh, The conclusion of verse 9 most literally, literally says, And the woman in the midst remaining. I almost can picture this. I mean, talk about the perfect scene made for a movie, right? I mean, can you just see the drama playing out if this were in a movie form? Jesus making this statement, and then he just starts, he bends down, he starts writing in the dirt, and the guys are just sitting there looking at him like, what are we going to do? What do we say? And maybe they're looking at each other a little bit, like, and then you see the older ones, they start dropping their rocks and walking away dejectedly, angry that Jesus got them. And then eventually they're all gone. And it's just Jesus kneeling down, riding in the dirt, and this woman. And he looks and he says, hey, where'd your accusers go? Is there no one left? And that's what we read here in the passage. Jesus, verse 10, straightened up and asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you. Jesus declared, go now and leave your life of sin. Again, Jesus came not to condemn, but to save. And this is exactly what we see in John 8. It's not that Jesus displays a permissive attitude towards sin. He doesn't do that at all. This is a significant point of difference between Jesus and our culture. Our culture says anything goes. Our culture says there is no right and wrong. Our culture says just do it. With what result? We are a people enslaved by sin. Even if we are able to free ourselves from healthy guilt, we are not free from sin's power. It's scary. Honestly, it's scary to see what's happening in in our culture and our unwillingness to call a spade a spade. Uh, it, and I don't know where things are heading, and I, I'm, I think it's scariest in our school systems just to see what's happening there and the fact that teachers aren't even allowed to say anything's wrong. There is no such thing as wrong. How dare you judge my child? It's, it's a scary world. But Jesus' message is one both of purity and mercy. In one breath, he frees her from both sin's condemnation and also from sin's power. And so his message there is purity and mercy. By the way, we had an excellent example of this in our service last week. Did you catch it? If you were here last week, we had a three-minute CareNet video, which we watched for Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. I'm not sure if you've noticed this in that video clip, but that video clip communicated the sanctity of human life both for the unborn child 
and for the mother who has committed this horrible atrocity. I mean, it's ugly, but you know what we need to remember is that these mothers are victims of the power of sin and of a culture that despises life. And I love the fact that this video and this little clip in, the, in, in a very powerful way said, the message is not purity or mercy, it's purity and mercy. We need to acknowledge this. And we need, we need to be careful as believers to be strong on truth, but also to recognize that the people who are speaking loudest for what is wrong, they're not our enemies it's the devil, it's the evil one, it's the power of sin. That's the enemy. And so we need to make sure we are not demonizing people rather than demonizing sin, that which is truly against God. So when it comes to turning from sin, as communicated in John 8, through purity and mercy, it makes me think of one other passage, one of my favorites, and I apologize if, uh, if you've heard me refer to this passage too many times in my preaching, or if you've been here for 16 years, you've probably heard me hit on this one time and again. But it's, it's just one that I think so well wraps up so much of what God is saying in His Word. It's Micah 6.8. He has showed you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. If you think about it, right here, to act justly. In other words, to do what is right, which Jesus upholds, and I think built into this is upholding the rights of others. I think to do right has both of those things involved. So doing right acts and upholding right for others. And to love mercy. As I've said before, this command is literally, in Hebrew, it's to love, love. That's what it says. The word for mercy here is chesed. And it's, he's saying we should love, love. We should love to be loving. We should love that. And finally, to walk humbly with our God, John 8. It's the perfect illustration of what Jesus is talking about here in John chapter 8. And so as we consider personal application this morning, I want to hit each of these areas. First of all, the application we have is do righteousness. God's Word defines what righteousness is. God's Word is our authority, not public opinion, not human justification, but divine law. Our first parents wanted to define right and wrong, right? Adam and Eve said, hey, we want to decide for ourselves. And for that, they were shown out of the garden and out of the presence of their maker. Righteous is, righteousness is not optional for the follower of Jesus. Instead, righteousness is to increasingly be the fruit that we bear as disciples of Christ. And so we must ask ourselves, are there any of the Bible's teachings on righteousness we are choosing to ignore? That's, that's why Jesus is getting on to the religious leaders, saying, you guys are choosing to ignore the sin in your own life. Is there anything that we're ignoring? Then we said, well, that's okay. And I got to tell you, I am so good at justification. I can justify just about anything. How about you? Righteousness. Christ's words to us is simple. Go and sin no more. So he says, we are not talking perfection but we're also not talking about turning a blind eye to teaching God's Word that doesn't agree with us. God's Word is not a buffet lunch where you get to pick and choose. It's all truth. God's Word is our authority. By the way, the elders are recommending this year some changes to our Constitution. Members will be getting a letter in the coming week or two. Uh, but one of the changes is we want to add just a small thing to the end of our, measure, our, our membership covenant. Just a, a few simple words because it talks about the Bible at the end of the membership covenant, we want to add these words, our final authority for faith and life. Now, it's communicated already in our doctrinal statement, really, but we want it in our, measure, in, our, in our membership covenant. So when we're making that covenant, we say, this is our final authority. This is the basis for how we live our lives. The second area of application is this, prioritize love. We all have the ability that I displayed in my in my condemning attitude toward that hero that I mentioned earlier, is there anyone in your life who you are prone to judge without healthy humility? Is there? Is there someone who you're just, you know, you're always, and, and you're lacking that, that conscious, conscience check where you say, is there a splinter in my own eye? Do I have healthy humility when it comes to this person? Because the goal here is salvation, right? 
That's Jesus' goal. The goal is restoration in relationships. It's not, the goal is not pointing out how others are wrong. That's not the goal. Fixing others is not the goal. It's salvation. It's restoration. That's the goal. Finally, walk with God. What does this have to do with righteousness and love? You might say, well, we're talking about righteousness and love. What is walking with God? Walking with God is what enables us to grow in righteousness. Walking with God is what enables us to grow in loving love, in prioritizing prioritizing love in our lives. If you want to thrive in purity and mercy, you must prioritize practicing the presence of God in daily devotions, weekly worship, genuine obedience. By the way, if you're looking for ways to grow your walk with God, I encourage you to read the Lamplighter article that's in your bulletins there. And at the end of it, you're going to see an area set off with some specific ideas of how to grow spiritually in this new year. I encourage you to take a look at that. Because that's what we're about. We want spiritual formation. We know that we'll grow in purity and love as we grow in Jesus. That's why we gather together every week. By the way, there's also a brand new adult studies brochure right on the other side of that door, a brand new one that talks about opportunities in February and March to get together with others and learn God's Word. Grab one of those if you're interested in checking that out. But it's just one of many spiritual growth opportunities that's listed at the end of that Lamplighter article, one of many ways to grow your walk with God. So as we close our time together... Is there anything God's leading you to as you look at your own life, any area of righteousness or love or your walk with God? Take just a moment now to commit those to Him in prayer, and then I'm going to close us. And God, this is our desire, to grow in righteousness, in purity, in obedience to you as our God, and to grow in love, in mercy, and compassion for others. And all of this by the means of growing ourselves in our walk with you. God, as we go out of this place this week, we want to walk with you more closely so that you can continue to make us into your image, people of purity and love. We pray this all in Christ's precious name. Amen.